So thank you so much, uh, Dale. This is water, if anyone <laughs> wonders. Um, I, I really feel the same way you do, Dale. And I also feel that you guys here are incredibly lucky uh, to be where you are. Not, I'm not talking about the winter. <laughs> We share that in Boston, we, we share the kind of pain, we share your pain. But I am talking about uh, having the will and having the moment that has arrived with socio-emotional development not anymore like a little sidekick, but a kind of recognition that in order for us to make progress on the educational issues, on the opportunity gaps, and on many of the things that we want for our children, that actually the time is now, the doors have opened, and you heard this, I mean, to have a mayor and to have a deputy secretary be as eloquent and as clear that this is a priority gives us an incredibly wonderful opportunity in this country, including Mayor Coleman's leadership, not only here, uh, but also across the country. I worked for many years with Mayor Menino, the mayor in Boston, who no one ever thought would actually step down. He was, I think, the mayor for 25 years or something like this. Um, and he had similar kind of aspirations, and it has been really a wonderful privilege to work as a team to represent the university, but in a collection of groups. And when Dale mentions New Directions as a publication that brings theory and research to practice, I think what we really need is not a one-way directionality, which people often call translational research, which is very important. But what we need is something actually much bigger than that, which is translational in both directions. So practitioners who have incredible wisdom and knowledge and are much closer to the children than the researchers, that they actually have a way to bring back what they're finding into the partnerships that we're forming. And I think that a lot of, even though we're here at the University of Minnesota and other you know, great, wonderful place to be at, especially here in the stadium. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, I think that a lot of the innovation right now is happening through social entrepreneurs and through people kind of right there in the community who know the community and who are coming up with incredibly, you know, new approaches. So that's what, what I'm part of, and I want to thank uh, all of you to have me here and to share some of the experiences from Boston, some of the experiences in terms of theory development and some of our practic practical work. I have a two and a half hour presentation, but <laughs> I was told I have 25 minutes, so I will condense it and go fast. So I hope you're, you're okay with that. Um, so, let me... Okay, I want to start with a picture, a simple picture. Take a look at it and recognize something about our approach in education. This is a picture taken in a school, and it is a format, it's a group, it started as a group, but it's continuing into a real curricular activity where we take young people who are actually angry, and they have good reason to be angry. These are middle schoolers who have seen much too much in their young years. And what we do is to say, look, we're going to give you a camera, each one of you, groups of 20, 15 to 20 kids, each one of you gets a camera, a throwaway camera, it costs nothing. And we want you, with the actual acceptance of the principal, the support of the principal and teachers, we want you to go around the school and your community and take pictures of things that you find unfair 
or reprehensible or problematic and that you want solutions for. And then these kids go out and take pictures in the most amazing ways, this is one of them, and come back with something that they write about, speak about, and then there's going to be, and always is, an exhibition where they actually present to the teachers, the parents, the families, and the uh, superintendent who comes to, uh, to join what their complaints are. And you know what's so great about this is these are kids who are on the way, and the mayor talked about this, who are on the way to a kind of delinquent pathway. And what we want to do is actually say, no, we want to see you as artists, as alienated artists, who can actually speak the language of art and image, who can write about it, and who can present in a communal way Now I have to put my voice a little down. Uh, I'm Maya. I'm 13 years old. I took a picture of Jamal's shadow over a dove. Innocent souls dying. I don't like violence or death. Now a couple of points here, and I don't want to spend too long on this. First point is the doves are a community response to violence in the sense that everywhere in Boston, where there is a crime, where a crime occurred, a dove is painted. Rapes, murders, you have the dove. So this is the kind of meaning of this for the young people. This is right in front of the school where a rape had happened. And this is the explanation of this young person saying, I am in solidarity with my friend and we together stand against violence, and we can't stand violence. Now, is this socio-emotional learning at its best? I think so. It's meaningful, it's deep, it's focused on expression, it's artistic, and it's not divided up between academic, social, and emotional. It's all, it's integrative. That's why I wanted to bring you this example. I could bring you many, many other examples. And what's so great is that the schools now, after they saw the groups as really being meaningful, took it into the curriculum, and now it's being taught. It's being part of what students do in their enrichment hours. So from there, I want to go to what the superintendent in Boston, Carol Johnson, who uh, left recently said, and I think she said it in very beautiful words, teachers report feeling ill-equipped to respond both to the academic needs of students and to students whose life experiences have damaged their spirits and sense of pur purpose and resiliency. Oh, actually, down there, there's a screen. I don't have to lean back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I think this, this describes well that educators are recognizing that they need the support of all of us, all of us educators, all of us people who are focused on the children. This is not something in this classroom or outside the classroom. So our center at Harvard uh, focuses on improving socio-emotional development in support of learning in and out of school. So we want to break down the barrier between school and after school. And I will describe to you some of the research that we are doing. So I want to start here also with the kind of definition. You heard this from uh, uh, Jim Sheldon, the issue of language. 
And you heard it also from Dale regarding what are we really talking about. And I think this is critical. So when we talk about assessment, the reason why I want to kind of go into the assessment issue is not just to have outcomes or not just to say, oh, after No Child Left Behind, we did the accountability on the academic side. Now let's do the accountability on the socio-emotional side. I think it is an exercise in clarity of thinking and clarity of goals. And when you actually look at the language, you see what our problems are. We have uh, non-cognitive skills. This is a very kind of welcomed approach these days, the non-cogs. But if you see what I put in parentheses, persistence, that's not non-cog. I don't know what non-cog is. That's cognitive as much as it is emotional. So the whole idea does not stick well with, I think, what we're trying to say. Then you get to a term that fortunately is slowly on the wane, which is soft skills. Oh, Google wants people with soft skills, right? You read Friedman's articles about Google recently, and they seem to want soft skills. But it's not soft at all. I think we shouldn't call them soft skills because they're really hard skills. I call them success skills. This is my new way of trying to kind of come up with some language that actually is a bridge between these different constructs. Because in order to make it in the world today, we need 21st century skills. And those are not skills where we kind of look people in the eye and can say, shake hands nicely, and because of that, we are socialized well. These are really skills about problem solving, about creative work together in order to make things that are meaningful and important. So that's not soft in my, in, in my language, and we shouldn't see academic as non-soft or hard, and this is the soft stuff. And then you get to the third point of what we're really talking about, and that's mental health. Well, I think a lot of people, when they say socio-emotional development, really mean mental health. Uh, and it is a hugely important area. And I will show you in one second, in one or two slides, why it's such a hugely important area. And for anyone who runs cities or governs states, to not recognize that we not only have a crisis in education, but at the same time, a huge crisis in mental health has a problem seeing the reality the way it is. So we call it socio-emotional health. We call it behavior development. We call it lots of different things, but it really also is mental health. And so here are the things that I think we're trying to cover in socio-emotional Learning is a pretty good term, but I think we have to go beyond it. I don't think it does the whole trick at bridging those success skills. So here are a couple of um, arguments for the mental health side that we're talking about. One in 16 children have been vic victimized sexually. This is uh, not Gil Norm's theory or a little bit of lit review. This is the CDC that states that. That means every teacher has at least two kids who have been sexually abused in their classroom. And all the sequela that come from that. One in 10 children has suffered from maltreatment. And, and the list is very long. One in four children have been exposed to violence, including indirect exposure to victimization, family violence, and community violence. So again, when we talk about socio-emotional learning, we got to keep in mind that that's part of what we're talking about. I want to now uh, get to the question of fragmentation. I had a great slide, but I took it out because of the, the, the time. I'm happy to share it with you. It's from the US Department, from the Department of Education in Massachusetts. It shows what a typical principal has to handle in his or her community and his or her school uh, house, school building. And you have everything from 
violence prevention, to after school, to social services, and it is really not manageable. The way it is organized right now is in a fragmented way, and it can't be managed the way it is. That's, that's really the issue here, and I think that's why I'm so excited about St. Paul's uh, initiatives because it could be a leading example of how one could begin to get from the compartmentalization to something that's more unified. So let me just show you briefly two ways in which I think defragmentation has to happen. The first one is that 25 years of our work, not just mine and my team's work, but really collectively, have led the Massachusetts state of education, educational department, uh, to create the public health pyramid and to accept it for socio-emotional development and academic work. This is huge. It basically says schools are responsible for the academic and the socio-emotional. You can see it right there. And you can also see that it has accepted the three tiers. So let me talk to you about the three tiers before we get there. Take a look at those numbers. These are conservative numbers, which means 15% of a population in the school or in the after school program have diagnosable mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, ADD, etc. 25% of kids have a subclinical level of problems, so they're not quite there yet. But if we let it happen over time and we don't prevent, they're going to show up at that level. So they are the kids who are sad. They are the kids who are angry, like the ones in the groups that I mentioned to you earlier. But they're not yet at a diagnostic level. And then we have certain things that we have to do for everyone, and that's only 60%. And in many urban settings, it's actually more like 45 or 50%. So. Um, before I get to the next slide, the different interventions at each level are called promotion, prevention, intervention. So at the tier one, we're talking about promotion, which means climate, school climate, uh, behavioral issues get supported. Like the school is a place where kids want to belong. At tier two, we're talking about groups, group interventions, the way I just mentioned it to you. And at tier three, we're talking about intervention, case, cases, and ways in which different services come together. So now, what I want to do is uh, show you, uh, super fast, a second defragmentation. Socio-emotional learning comes out of socio-emotional development. And I actually believe that we should go back to that term because we're talking more than learning. We're talking about the developing child. And I think that what has happened is that too much of the development of socio-emotional skills has kind of dropped out in the process. We need to bring it back in. And so what I want to show you is a kind of starting point for us at PEAR of saying what are the core elements of what children need in order to thrive. So in other words, we go from the system to the individual. And what we're finding here are, based on studies and based on interviews and based on observations, four elements. You can add to those elements, but we chose four elements. One is active engagement. The second one is uh, assertiveness. The third one is belonging. And the fourth one is reflection. So what I mean with that is, the active engagement is that children and adolescents, when they come to school, when they go to the after-school programs, they need body impulse control, they need hands-on experiences, they need sports, they need nutrition. Second, and this is what they tell us, they need leadership, they need to feel power, they need to feel voice, and they need to feel choice. Very important to them. Third, they need trusting relationships, they need uh, empathy, and they need trust. And fourth, you could say self-awareness, insight, analysis, but really what they need is meaning, meaning in life. So those are the elements. And, you know, if you ask me a question later, um, what I will do 
is show you a little mini video of how, what that looks like in, in, in young children. But I won't do this right now because Dale will get very nervous and I want to get to the data, so let me do this later. But what I do want to show you is when you have this connection of these four elements, one of the things you have is actually a, a developmental notion because young children up to five are mostly kind of in their bodies. It's very important for them to really connect to the world viscerally. In middle childhood, assertiveness, competition, industry, as Erickson calls, autonomy become very critical. In young adolescents, the teamwork, the belonging, the group inclusion is essential. And then in later adolescence, the whole issue of who am I, where am I going becomes essential. But in contrast to the stage theories that have been very important to socio-emotional learning, I believe that these four elements are there with us from the beginning and even are there in adulthood. So I'm actually, in this work that I've done, come to the recognition or come to at least the bold statement that this, this is mental health. If you have those four elements working well together, you have a pretty good def definition, not only of socio-emotional learning, but also of mental health. And that's what's so exciting, the integration that you can say, now we have a notion of positive mental health, we have a youth development framework, and in fact, it is also a framework for life skills for success skills. So I've connected them here, you see them here, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time or any time showing you that out of these four what we call clover leaves come also a definition of life skills. And by the way, since we're already at the integration process, good curricular interventions, good learning in classrooms academically is exactly along those youth development principles only that educators don't like to necessarily use the term. It starts with hands-on. It has to get to the relevance. This is important to me. I want to learn this. That's the assertiveness. It goes to, I'm really being supported by people around me. And it goes to the end, which is I step back and I understand certain principles. So I think what we have here is an integrating framework, and I'm not saying this is the only one, we can have multiple ones, Castle has one, etc. but I think this is a developmental framework that brings things together. And now, what I want to do in the remaining few minutes is to show you what this looks like in terms of assessment. So what we've created is our two, school, two tools. One is for uh, students, the other one is for teachers. The student version, it takes about 20 minutes, it can be done in school or in after school. Kids enter it, if possible, into the computer. And they're being told, not like this is another assessment you have to do. They're being told in the beginning of the year in September, sometimes really a few days after school begins, or the after school programs begin, look, this is a chance for you to tell us what you're strong in, what you want help with, what the supports are that you want. And we often use it not only for student support systems, so the mental health side of things, we also use it for partnerships, so that a whole partnership team around the school comes together and makes decisions based on kids' input. We also have a teacher version, but I will not talk about the teacher version. I will just show you a couple of slides, and then I will be done on the version for the young, for the young people. This is what it looks like. This is an individual case. So we get a whole school or a whole district to participate with us. And we turn this around within about 24 to 48 hours because it's computer assisted. And then the school gets it either on an individual level, on a classroom level, or on a school-wide level, or when we do it for after school, they also get it for the whole after school or for individual children. And what we have here is a clover-based, asset-oriented system where you will see, if you, if you take a look at this, you see three different components. One is a school cognitive component. These were the kind of uh, 
elements I mentioned before. You then have a relationship component of peers and adults, and then we have a kind of resiliency level component which includes somewhat mental health. And so when you do this, it takes us about a short time to actually interpret this. We could do this together in half an hour. You would be able to actually start interpreting this. And what you have here is the orange, which used to be red, but we're sharing it with the kids. So people, the kids told us red is not the best color if you want to share things with us because it's one standard deviation below the norm. The line is the norm. We now have about 15,000 cases. And so we have really strong norms and we can compare kids and ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. And the green is one standard deviation above the norm. So this is a screen where you get a sense where does the child or the classroom fit. And here is, uh, so when we look at this profile, we have critical thinking from the perspective of the child is pretty low. On the other hand, academic motivation is very high. Well, that's great news. So now you can actually figure out how can we build on the academic motivation the child has with, at the same time, knowing that critical thinking from the perspective of the child is low. So what do we put in place? It's not just, oh, how do we get a therapist in here? But it's really about what can we do in the after-school hours, in the world of the child, or in the school day to increase and bring those kids who have a problem with critical thinking together to increase that. On the relationship side, you have here a kind of average. It's above the line, but it's still blue. That means it's not a standard. It's not statistically significant. But then when you look at the resiliencies, what you have there is action orientation is high, but emotion control is low. Optimism is high. That's very important because optimism low often means depression. So we get here also to the symptoms without ever asking about the symptoms directly. But we do get a sense of a child. I mean, if I would have to now figure out on this child level, what am I going to do? I would say we need to help this child to regulate emotions, to get more focused, to really learn some critical thinking skills, while at the same time really allowing this child to have leadership opportunities and to expand on the motivational side of things. And I will end just with um, one more slide, which now shows you classrooms. And so in a school, a classroom is being compared, a few classrooms, um, and, um, and girls and boys in these classrooms. This particular slide just shows you the uh, differences between boys and girls in this particular school. And what's really interesting is actually, in contrast to many other of the studies we have, is that the girls are doing worse than the boys in this school. And if you, especially if you look at the relationships that the girls have with adults and peers, those particular girls in sixth, sixth to eighth grade are basically saying, we're having a problem with relationships. So again, if you now have this data, you can begin to actually think as a principal and as a team of teachers, how are we going to help the girls have better experiences in our school? And you get this data very early in the year. You can also bring together your partners, and the partners look at this data, and can actually say, we want to do something about this. We're going to actually have extra support for the girls in these middle school classes because that's what they need. So uh, this is just a taste because we, I didn't show you, and I don't have enough time today, I'll do that tomorrow, some of the teacher ratings for their whole classroom. We use also some of this data for retrospective, which I want to just end with to just say, that what we're finding when we ask the children, have you actually changed on these socio-emotional dimensions or success skills over the last year or over the summer when we do this with summer programs? It is very interesting that in those programs that are strong, the students actually tell us that they have made a lot of gains, including in areas like critical thinking and persistence. And in those programs that are actually weaker, 
they really tell us that they have stayed the same or have actually gotten worse in these areas. So we actually are very encouraged by something that our research uh, colleagues often state as not biased or not quite you know, rigorous enough, but we want to really go in this direction of trying to give the children more voice by describing whether they have changed or not, and then comparing that to how the teachers and others see this. So with that, I hope you can see that this work of assessment is not just one more standardized testing, but it is a way to really, with data, support kids and figure out partnerships that really make it possible to know the population, and because you know the population, you can also kind of make a difference in the experience they have throughout a given year. Thank you very much.